After six days, Jesus took him, took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them to a high mountain, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared with them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. There are two mountains. There are always at least two mountains. And there is always darkness and there is always light. These are things that we can understand and there are, these, are, these are things that we know to be true. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the mountains. He created the sea. He created the darkness. And He created the light. In John 1, we see that Christ is the light who came into a dark world in order to lighten the light, the light in the hearts of every man. Now, there has to be a reason for such a thing. There has to be a reason that the light enters into the darkness. And the reason is because the darkness which God saw was good at one time became a darkness of sin. A darkness in which thieves could maneuver, murderers could maneuver, adulterers could maneuver without anyone seeing them. They could go from here to there causing sin, spreading their lies, their treachery, and their satanic ways under the cover of darkness. And if you wish to see true evil, see the same who do and so in the light. Satan, or Lucifer, who in the Latin, Lucifer meaning the light bearer, the one who carries the light. And we sinners, we fly to it like ignorant moths to a flame. Why? Because Satan is able to offer us things that we really appreciate. You've heard me say before, and I'll say it many times again, sinning's fun. If it wasn't fun, you wouldn't want to do it so much. That's the great thing about uh, Satan's power. It's not that he has the same uh, majesty and, and almightiness of God himself. It's that he's got what you want. Christ has what you need. Every child here would prefer to eat candy every single day for every meal. And it would kill you. And yet, what Christ offers is meat. You have two mountains. Usually, you have two mountains and many pastors will preach I refuse to do this, but I think it's important that I bring it up. We'll preach that the mountain of transfiguration is all about overcoming things in your life. And that once you reach the pinnacle of the mountain, you see and God will bless you with not only His countenance, but riches upon high. You will be the great ones of Jesus. All you have to do, and you don't even have to quit your sinning. All you got to do is just do what makes Jesus happy. And again, the ironic thing is that, have you ever noticed that what makes Jesus happy often agrees with you? Isn't that true? God told me 
Well, did you happen to disagree with him? Oh, no, no, no. It just so happened that my opinion and God's opinion are the same thing. No, see, we belong at the bottom of the mountain. And we deserve, rather, for uh, the words that Christ spoke when he was heading to the cross. There will come a time when we will say, let the rocks fall down upon me. Let the rocks fall upon earth, uh, us. Blessed are the wombs that, that never gave birth and the breasts that never nursed. For the time is coming when chaos will reign. And as we look to the future and we say, okay, that time is coming. Never forget that it's our sin here, now, that, that, that ushers in wickedness. Like I said, Satan wants us. He doesn't desire those he already has. But certainly he sets traps for those that he wants. And what's ironic, as Luther said, and Tom Waits also once said, where, where God builds a church, the devil builds a chapel. That is, what is Satan's looks an awful lot like what is God's. If you will go upon this mountain, you will find the transfigured Christ. If you are to go upon this mountain, you will find the glistening ba Baal, the idol. Aren't they both the same? Or at least one here is temporal and the other one is, of course, eternal. Do you have a choice? Do you choose the idol or do you choose the transfigured Jesus? And I say it's not a choice at all. Because if it was up to you, you would choose neither and remain in the den of sin. Eventually, which leads your dead body to the idol anyway. But rather, there are two mountains. There are the, there's the mountain that Peter, James, and John attended. The mountain where they came and they saw Christ. But not just any Christ. You notice when he was born in the, in the uh, uh, nativity narrative, it was a star that led the Gentiles onto the gospel. The star was the gospel for the Gentiles. And it led them to the Christ. But all of a sudden now we see a completely different star. We see Christ in His glory. We see the transfigured Christ. The star of David is no more than this now. That Christ shines brighter than the star of David for He is of the line of David and will do what David never could have. And Peter, James, and John say exactly what we all would say. We sinners would say, Tis good, Lord, to be here. This is the Jesus we want. This is the Jesus that we want. We want the Jesus who, gl who glorifies us, who we get some of, of, of the light that, that basks off the glow of the Savior. We want some of the glory of Jesus. That's why we carry around the moniker of Christian. Instead of praying, worshiping, receiving the Lord's Supper, and hearing the Word of God, we carry around the title of Christian. And say, well, I'm a Christian. Oh, well, then, are you basking in the glow of Christ's transfiguration? Well, no, of course not. If you are to say that you are a Christian, that is to say that you are a receiver. Receiver of the goods that Christ brings to you. The transfiguration is an epiphany. It was to show Peter, James, and John, three sinners, who the true God was, the true Messiah who had come. Christ was transfigured so that we would believe that He was the Son of God. And in case the transfiguration wasn't enough, God the Father says it. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so Peter, James, and John do what we want, would want to do. Let's keep Jesus here in our back pocket. Let's keep him like a genie. 
that when we need him, we can rub the lamp and ask the questions and get what we want from Christ. But this reduces Christ to nothing more than a Savior. A Savior who in all sincerity we use as prostitution. That we use for our desires and then cast aside once we're done with them. That's what sinners do. Prostitute Christ. Use Him for what we want and then toss Him aside. We gratify ourselves and we move on. Damnable are we. Peter, James, and John see Moses and Elijah and Christ and say, let us sit, set up temple uh, uh, tents so that we can come and visit anytime we want. We need Christ to be here. We need Moses in the law to be there. We need Elijah and the prophets to be there. And right here we have the great trifecta of what we want. But that's not the purpose of the transfiguration. The purpose of the transfiguration is to show the glory of Christ. And then the next mountain is not the mountain of, ba of Baal or Baal. The next mountain is Golgotha. The next mountain is the mountain of the skull. So for Peter, James, and John to stay on this mountain, then there would never be the salvation of mankind on the other mountain. The place of the skull. The crucifixion of Christ. Christ would not prostitute himself for the sake of fleeting and temporal gifts, but rather would give them freely by the blood that drips from the cross upon his faithful. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying, be good little boys and girls and Jesus will forgive you. I'm saying you aren't good little boys and girls. Repent and receive the forgiveness of Christ. Tis good Lord to be here where Christ comes in His body and His blood where you pass the baptismal font where you have been saved and upon this mountain you shall receive the true glory of Christ. Bread and wine transfigured given unto you. So that you can say, I am a Christian not by title, but I am a Christian by diet. I am a Christian by washing. I am a Christian by hearing. You see, the point of Christ's transfiguration, as I said, is an epiphany. So that the three would know that Christ was who He said He was. And while we all run to gather around that mountain, it's upon the other mountain that Peter, James, and this John would run away. They would not see the cross. They would scatter. For there's no glory there. There's no prosperity there on the cross. At least not to be there amongst the people. They would run away. Because there's nothing to be transfigured. There's only a God there to die. And He dies for all of us who run away. When He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, He is saying literally, my God, my God, why have you turned your face away from me? Why is your face not shining upon me? And it's for this reason. It's because he who knew no sin took your sin onto himself. He could not, God the Father could not bear to see his own son because he took on all of your iniquity. He could not stand to look at his own son. Because all of our sins were placed upon Him. But even with, his even with God the Father's face turned away, 
he could not miss the smell that entered into his nostrils from the burnt sacrifice that was his only begotten son on the cross for the forgiveness of all mankind. Tis good, Lord, to be here, but only one person desires to keep Christ from the cross, and that's Satan. I'm so glad to see the church full today because it means that it is good to be here. It means that we desire to be on the mountain, particularly here on the mountain in Hickory, as the shining beacon of Lutheranism throughout Catawba County, and to say, "'Tis good, Lord, to be here. It is also good, Lord, to be on this side of the cross." where we have the forgiveness of sins. And we know that from that empty tomb, you also have ascended into heaven. And that when you come again to judge both the living and the dead, we Lutherans, we look forward to it. We don't dread it. When we talk about the rapture, we don't talk about the millennial reign or any other such nonsense. We talk about this. We raise from the dead. And the pastors point to Christ. And Christ says... I have come to judge the living and the dead. And the living are those who have Christ in them. And the dead are those who do not. On the mountain, when Christ comes to judge the living and the dead, on that mountain, we will see the Son of God who has forgiven you of your sins and who you will eat and drink and take with you, you will see on that mountain when all flesh is resurrected, Christ say to you, tis good children for you to be here in everlasting life in heaven forever receiving the feast the banquet of the Lamb in His kingdom. I, for one, can't wait. But you know what? As a sinner, we're going to have to. While we're here, let us be receivers. Forgive one another quickly. Eat of the transfigured flesh, transfigured blood. Forgive be forgiven. And also, as you get up to leave, as you come down from the mountain of Augustana, make sure to tell of everyone the vision that you saw here today. For the Son of Man has been raised from the dead, and He will come again to do the same thing for all of those who are out there and for all who are in here. Because when Christ comes to judge the living and the dead, it doesn't mean the ones who are alive and walking and those who are in the ground, but those who have Christ and those who do not. So if you want to be safe in the world, suppose having a concealed carry might help, but I promise you, that walking around with Christ in your system is a much more foolproof way of trusting in the Lord. Amen.